All right, well, thank you all again for joining us and welcome. Our conversation today is uh, different energy storage technologies in the 21st century. And I'm very pleased to have Kevin Lewis of Idaho Rivers United and the Hydropower Reform Coalition to uh, lead us through this conversation. So I will turn it over to Kevin. Great, so I should do the old share screen thing again, right? That's right. And do this. And do this. Perfect, now you just, you just need to go to the first slide. Yeah, I have to get back to the first slide, let's see. There we go. Okay, yeah. get stuff out of my way so I can see what I'm looking at. Okay, great. Um, just a little bit of a little bit of background here. Um, I've been involved in hydro licensing for somewhere in, in the neighborhood of 25 years. I, I started in California, Northern California as a volunteer with my local paddling club. I'm an avid whitewater user. Uh, I'd followed um, hydro relicensing in the American Whitewaters Journal since back in the 1980s when they kind of helped pioneer the use of hydropower licensing to uh, restore uh, other benefits back to the river, uh, recreational benefits, ecological benefits. So just by chance, there was a local relicensing going on where I lived in Northern California and I. Uh, I volunteered, and that was kind of the beginning of the end for me. Um, in uh, 2004, I actually changed careers and came to Idaho uh, to work with Idaho Rivers United. And so for like 12 years, I was the conservation director. In three years, I was the executive director. Uh, once again, uh, a portion of my work was hydropower stuff. Um, IRU is what we call Idaho Rivers United is on the steering committee of the Hydropower Reform Coalition. So I represented IRU on the steering committee. So uh, we, we did that kind of work and we had relicensing projects here in Idaho. And uh, I was fortunate enough, no, enough to be able to retire at the end of, uh, end of 2019. Um, but I've kind of stayed associated with IRU. I do some contract work doing HRC stuff and I also do some volunteer work. Um, but uh, my previous career was was in auto repair, so I'm pretty technically minded, mechanically minded, and so um, hydropower kind of always fascinated me in the, in the way it worked and everything. So, um, in some respects, I have no uh, no qualifications for this conversation. In other respects, I do. Um, kind of the goal, my goal of, of the presentation is to you know briefly look at, at how the need for store energy storage has evolved over this last quarter of a century and then touch on a few types of, of energy storage. And uh, it's not really my desire to basically pick winners and losers in this kind of a conversation. Um, in reality, I think that uh, the storage problem will be solved with a mix of, 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 of a number of storage technologies. And ultimately, I think the market's gonna decide what that's going to, going to be. So let's get started. Um, Looking back, to start with, uh, you know, back when I first got involved in, in the mid '90s, uh, kind of the energy picture in this country was you had uh, your base load generation, which is basically you know power that's generated 24/7 around the clock, um, and it was supplied by by pretty much large thermal plants, so uh, coal-fired plants, oil-fired plants, nuke plants. And, and some run of river hydropower, uh, basically hydropower that uh, uh, really had to be generated because they had no storage capacity. So it, it generally it was, was were small projects, but but they were part of that that base load uh, generation. Uh, the way the typical energy cycle in this country works is people wake up in the morning, start turning on lights and making breakfast and, and the, the, the load or demand. Um, starts to increase, uh, people go to work, go to school, just do their daily lives, um, you know, business startup, industry ramps up a bit. And so you have kind of a, um, 
you know, a, a, a demand throughout the course of the day. People come home at night, make dinner, watch TV. Uh, there's kind of a spike in, in, in demand at that point. And then as people go to bed and turn lights off and stop doing things, turn the furnaces down, uh, you drop back down to a, a lower load level uh, at night. But so basically base load generation was, was kind of designed to, to accommodate as much of that as possible. But the thing about, about the energy grid and, and electricity is, um, yeah, you have to use it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a constant balancing act, very complicated balancing act of, of generating enough electricity to meet all your needs, yet not having too much. It, it doesn't work when you don't have enough energy and it doesn't work when you have too much energy. So load following or peaking generation basically was, was developed to throughout the course of, of, of a day and night you know, as your demand increased or decreased, your load following projects could increase or decrease the amount of generation they were supplying to kind of keep us in that balance. Uh, and that pretty much it was supplied by uh, hydropower that had storage capacity so they could actually, you know, uh, ramp up generation, ramp down generation. Uh, pump storage hydropower uh, was developed. I'll talk about that more in a second. And gas turbines. Uh, Going back, you know, your large thermal plants, they do not, they do not tolerate uh, change very well at all. Uh, a lot of them are very massive. Um, they, don't, they don't like thermal cycles. You don't throttle them back and throttle them back up or shut them down and then turn them back on. You certainly don't do that with a nuke. Um, you get a nuke going and stable, you leave it that way until it's time to refuel unless, it, unless something breaks down. So uh, load following, um, Actually, uh, the, the pump storage component is interesting because pump storage, which has you know, been around, it was actually first developed in 1907 uh, in Switzerland and became feasible in the 1930s when they developed reversible pump turbines. And, and we'll talk about pump storage later on, but um, these days when you talk about energy storage, you hear a lot of, a lot of buzzwords about pump storage being the, the, the solution to all the problems. And, uh, you know, it, it certainly is, can be a solution to some of the problems, but it's not a new technology. I, I think there are improvements to be made in pump storage, but uh, it's not a new technology. So you, you, you move forward now 25 years uh, and after you know, a, a onslaught of the development of, of renewable wind and solar projects, um, at the same time, a lot of that old baseload generation has gone away. Um, you know, uh, some due to obsolescence, um, you know, coal plants have closed down, uh, nukes have closed down, pg and is going to retire, Diablo Canyon, which was, it's a huge nuclear plant, a uh, huge controversy when it was built. And now they're retiring at many years ahead of schedule because they discovered that it's not competitive in the market anymore. So uh, base load is now uh, supplied by, you know, the, the, the limited thermal stuff that is out there. I mean, Idaho still uses some coal. It's not generated here in the state, it's generated in Wyoming, but it's, it's coal, coal, coal power um, and hydropower. And then your load following is, is now supplied by gas turbines, hydropower, just like in the in the previous case, and then we have wind and, and PV solar, which a lot of folks like to call intermittent. Um, I would call PV a lot more predictable than wind. Uh, the sun rises every day, unless it's cloudy, but it's pretty well. You, you pretty well know when the sun's going to shine, that sort of thing. So, uh, uh, so there, there there's kind of quite quite a difference in, in, in how power is is produced today than what it was 25 years ago. Let's go on to the next one. So the next two slides are, are, are some excerpts from recently Hi, released. Kevin, can I jump in just sure. for a second? We can hear you more clearly if you're facing towards the, the mic. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I'm using a little notebook. It's not exactly the greatest thing in the world. Um, how's that? Is that okay? Perfect. Okay, I'll just keep facing, 
face it forward. Um, so the next two slides are, are excerpts from just recently released long range plans here in the Northwest. This, this first one is from the Northwest Power Plan that was just finalized uh, a few months ago. And uh, the two bullet points are pretty telling. Uh, and I don't like to read stuff off the screen to folks, but you can read it yourselves. Uh, <clears throat> it's pretty telling that, that the, uh, the changes have been, have been dramatic in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, this next slide is from my own utility, Idaho Power. This is their 2021 uh, integrated resource plan, which was just released. Uh, and their 20 year plan, their new 20 year plan, you know, is basically going, going uh, carbon free with the addition of 3,790 megawatts of new uh, generation consistent of wind, solar, and storage technologies. I would argue the storage technologies is not generation, but that's a different part of the conversation. Especially telling in this, this IRP and this statement is, it's kind of ironic because Idaho Power spent the last 10, 15 years killing wind and solar generation in Idaho. Uh, they went to the PUC uh, a number of years back and, and got the, uh, the, the PURPA uh, maximum project size for PURPA for, for wind generation cut from five megawatts down to 200 kilowatts. In other words, a single wind turbine cannot qualify for a PURPA power. Then they went after solar and uh, got the PUC to limit long-term contracts for solar projects to two years. So the only people that are building any kind of renewable projects in Idaho right now is Idaho Power itself. They're building their own solar farms, but they don't want anybody else to build it. So there's a little bit of irony there, but, but that's okay. I, I can live with it. Uh, but once again, it's just, it's pretty telling that, that you know, Idaho is not exactly a, a environmentally friendly state. It tends to be a very, you know, carbon heavy pro-nuke kind of, kind, of kind of a state. And even our, our biggest utility is saying, it's going to be non-carbon stuff in the future. So, which jumps us over to um, storage. And uh, there's basically five types uh, of, of energy storage. Um, and I mean, there's stuff being added all the time. So this, this is, uh, this is uh, not ironclad at all. You've got mechanical storage, which is pump storage, gravity technologies, uh, compressed air and other compressed gases, flywheels, electrochemical is basically battery technology, uh, thermal, uh, you know, molten salt, uh, ice, I mean, thermal chemical storage, electrical supercapacitors, then hydrogen-based uh, storage, which is basically uh, splitting water, to break it into hydrogen, oxygen, and use the hydrogen to uh, for fuel cells, that sort of thing. Uh, some of these things are are uh, very theoretical, <laughs> and some of these things are, are are you know they're actually proven technology. I, I would I would argue that pump storage is proven. Um, uh, batteries obviously are are, are proven. Uh, there's a couple others, uh, compressed air, I wanna talk about later on, it, it, it's interesting. But uh, other things are, are very conceptual or are in early stages of development. And time and, and you know, at the end, the market will decide what's, what's really gonna work. But, uh, but so we're kind of, kind, of, kind of focus, taking a little closer look at pump storage, batteries, and, and a couple other little things uh, at, at this point. So let's talk about pump storage first, since it's been around since 1907. Uh, basically, you have a, an upper reservoir and a lower reservoir. And when power prices slash demand is low, you use lower cost electricity to pump water uphill into the upper reservoir where it's stored until the demand goes up slash price goes up 
and you then generate with that water going downhill through the turbines. Um, basically, your turbine is a two-way turbine pump assembly, so it can double as a pump or a turbine. Um, like I say, it's proven technology. There's a number of pump storage projects around the country. Um, I would say some of the, 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 the uh, negatives on pump storage are, um, they are very expensive to build. They're, they're very, very uh, infrastructure heavy. Um, a thousand megawatt pump storage project can easily break $2 billion uh, to build, maybe even $3 billion. Um, they have a pretty large footprint. Um, and so, so there are some challenges and it's kind of borne out by, there are a, a number of pump storage projects in this country that are mothballed right now. They're not even operating. And uh, as much as the hydro industry is, is waving the banner for pump storage development, it's, it's a little hard to, to, to uh, balance that with, with the fact that there's pump storage is not operating. Um, I also track a lot of, of uh, preliminary permits on pump storage and here in Idaho, in my 15 years at IRU, I probably saw 15 or 20 preliminary permit applications for pump storage. Not a single one of them ever went anywhere except one that's moving a bit right now. And it is a, it's called Cat Creek Energy. It's over on the South Fork of the Boise. And it's kind of a combination wind farm, solar farm, pump storage out of an existing reservoir. But I think the only thing that's really given that thing legs, it's also a, a way to move water from the Boise watershed over into uh, Elmore County, which has a pretty starved aquifer. So it's an basin transfer of water. And I think more than anything else, that's what's making that project have legs is the fact that there's powerful people that want to move water from the Boise River over to, the, over to Elmore County. Otherwise, I don't think that project would go anywhere either. So um, and I think finally, there's a, there's a project I've been following over in southeastern Oregon, outside of Klamath Falls, called the Swan Lakes Pump Storage Project. It actually got a license in April of 2019. FERC requires that you start construction within two years um, on your project. Well, in 2021, the licensee went back to FERC and said, we need an extension you know, before we start construction. So they now have a two or three year extension. And to date, they haven't turned a single shovel of dirt on this project. So once again, if, if pump storage was such a great, great idea, I don't see a whole lot of construction yet. Uh, even when you have a license, I don't see construction yet. So, so but, but it, it does work. I think the other one of the other negatives on pump storage is that is that it is uh, it, it suffers a bit in, in the in the efficiency arena. So all storage projects, all energy storage projects, consume more energy than they return. That's just the nature of the beast. And you know, if you charge a battery and hold it in your hand, it'll be warm to the touch. Well, that's energy that's not going to come back from that battery. That's energy that it took to charge that battery. The same applies to pump storage. For, you know, it, it, its efficiency is somewhere in the 75 to 80% range, which basically means that, you know, there's a 25, 20 to 25% cost in electricity to pump that water uphill over what you get from when it generates when it comes downhill. So, uh, Basically, all energy storage projects are net consumers of energy. The advantage is, is, is you're able to shift that energy use to a, a period when you need the energy. So, you know, as many people is worth it. I think the, in, in the big picture, though, it is that, that difference in efficiency uh, and response time. You know, pump storage plant, it takes time to stop that pump and spin it the opposite direction and generate power. Um, time is a factor. So there, there are lots of pluses and minuses. And I don't really want to get into the weeds because we could have this conversation for about three days. So pump storage, uh, one, one type of energy uh, storage. Uh, batteries uh, is, is, a, is a now a proven form of storage. Um, 
I just threw this photo in because in a lot of battery storage, this is what it really is. It's just masses of smaller cells linked together into larger and larger components. And they'll start small scale and you just keep piling these things up until you get to a, you know, a shipping container size of, 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 of modules that all link together and, and work. Um, I think that it's important to know that when you're talking about battery storage, there is a plethora of different types of batteries, different construction methods, different materials, uh, different safety concerns. You know, uh, lithium ion batteries have, you know, have kind of a, a reputation, especially back in the early days of spontaneously combusting. Uh, the Chevy, Chevy Bolt, the production on the Chevy Bolt is still halted while they try and deal with battery pack issues. They have, have had something like 17, 17 vehicles spontaneously combust, and they're now recalling the first three years of production to automatically replace their batteries, and the remaining production vehicles are going to inspect them all. Um, so, you know, that's what happens when you have bad manufacture of batteries. Um, to be fair, though, when you look at the like the Chevy Bolt and its and its tendency to burn people's houses down when they're charging it in the garage, um, when you look at do the do the percentages of of, of of bolts that have caught on fire versus the number produced, that percentage is still vastly less than a percentage of normal internal combustion vehicles that catch on fire and burn down. So. But it, it tends to be that the, the electric vehicles uh, tend to get all the press when things like this happen. Um, so this this is a, this is a, a this is a Tesla Mega Pack, and uh, this is actually a screenshot from their website where you can go order your Tesla Mega Pack. And uh, this this first shot here is a, a single Mega Pack, which is it's it's basically a, will provide you essentially one megawatt power for four hours, nonstop. Uh, if you look at the fine print, you can have it delivered a year from now, quarter one of 2003. Uh, installation costs are included, um, and it's about one, $1. million. So if anybody tells you that batteries are not mainstream, uh, I, I, I would argue differently. Um, just, for, just for giggles, I went ahead and Entered a thousand mega packs since that's the maximum quantity you can order. And that's about you know one point one point three billion dollars. Uh, still, a five thousand dollar credit card will will secure your order uh, today. Um, and so, uh, these these installations are being installed around the world uh, and have been for a number of years now, and and, and they're very successful. Batteries like these um, are great for frequency regulation. They're great with response time. They can respond in milliseconds to, to uh, grid variations. Um, uh, they actually provide what's called black star capacity. So it's restarting the grid uh, after a big power failure, uh, pretty important capacity. So um, batteries are, are definitely, um, are definitely uh, part of the mix. And actually, just to kind of wrap up the battery, to, to kind of emphasize that, um, I just recently read that China's largest state-owned grid operator plans to install 100,000 megawatts of battery storage by 2030. At the same time, they plan on reducing the cost of battery production by, by 30% by 2025. And then they're also going to increase their pump storage from 26,000 megawatts to 120,000 megawatts. So the Chinese, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely serious about this. In the US, uh, I think uh, recently I read that utility scale PV and battery storage is going to be 60% of the, uh, the new capacity added in the US over the next two years. That's about 10,000 megawatts of battery storage. And 60% uh, of that will be co-located low co-located with with solar so uh batteries are 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 a are a uh, a big deal and, and i think they're uh and, you know, price wise i think they're very economical 
Uh, we can talk about other batteries things later on in the discussion if people want to. I'll keep moving on because I want to get this with them. And this is what a, this is what a typical uh, battery installation might look like. This is in Southern California Edison you know, in the suburbs somewhere. You basically pour concrete pads, drop these modules in place, wire them all together, build a wall around it, and uh, you're up and running. When the power prices go down, you charge your batteries. When the power prices go up, you discharge your batteries. And that differential is what pays for your project and makes the return for your investors. The American way. That's that. Um, another technology that, that is, I find really kind of fascinating is what they call ACAES. It stands for Advanced Compressed Air Energy Storage. And uh, uh, this is a company out of Toronto, Canada. They built a demonstration project back in 2015. It worked. They're now pursuing uh, four large scale projects, two in Southern California and two in Australia. But basically what they do is they, they, they tunnel underground directly down thousand to two thousand feet and build large chambers. Um, they have a reservoir up on the surface and that reservoir is connected to those chambers. So if, if the project's discharged, those chambers are full of water. Uh, if you're a thousand feet, if you're a thousand feet down, that's 500 psi is, is the pressure of the water at the bottom. And then when you you charge your system, you have an air compressor on the surface which pushes air down and displaces that water out of those caverns. As, as rooms, pushes it back up to the surface. Um, then when you want to generate, you, you run that air back up through your generator. And what the water does is the water is, it helps maintain a constant pressure. So um, whether you're generating on the, on the first bit of air you have or the last bit of air is still under the same amount of pressure. And that's, a, that's what makes the, the project very efficient. Um, so much so that I, that just uh, just in the last month, uh, Hydro so Store actually secured a quarter of a billion dollar investment from Goldman, Goldman Sachs, along with a billion pounds over in England to uh, to uh, over there it was to investigate using old mothballed natural gas cavities to use for their their uh, their caverns. Um, in the in California, they've uh, they're looking at a. Uh, 500 megawatt project in Kern County and a 400 megawatt project out by Moss Landing out on the kind of Southern California coast, Southern Central California coast. Um, both, um, you know, if, if, you, if you listen listen and read their hype, you know, they, they claim to be more efficient than battery storage. Uh, I mean, that's the thing about all these storage technologies, is you dig into them, there's always a lot of hype. And at, at the end of the day, it's, it's you know, what it actually does, uh, how it actually produces, and you know, is, is it economical? Um, so uh, there, there are a number of other, uh, obviously, forms of storage, and uh, I would welcome you. Uh, Google could be your friend. YouTube could be your friend. You could spend the rest of your life uh, watching and reading about different storage technologies, but maybe you have better things to do. Um, so I, I think with that, it took about a half an hour, which is what I wanted to do. Um, we can move on from there. And uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Kevin. That was great. Um, bail out of there. OK. Perfect. All right. Well, let's move into the Q&A portion. Um, and I realized that I was remiss and did not introduce myself to those of you who are on this call who I haven't met. I'll just say quickly, I'm Colleen McNally Murphy. I'm the Associate National Director of the Hydropower Reform Coalition. Um, so let's see, does anyone have any questions burning or um, shall I kick us off? Feel free to jump in. All right, well, I'll start us off while everyone's formulating. So Kevin, if can you talk a bit about the different regulatory processes that these different technologies have to go through and uh, timelines associated with those? Sure, I mean, some of us, maybe most of us, I don't know, are, you know, we're pretty, pretty well aware of the FERC process. So pump storage is FERC licensed. Uh, 
So it's the normal licensing process. Um, easily, easily could take, you know, probably six to 10 years to, to build a project. Uh, 10 years might be kind of the outside, but but I, I it really depends on what the circumstances are. I mean, you, you could have a, a site location that was entirely benign, had no environmental impacts, had no cultural impacts, um, had a lot of support. I mean, you could you could probably sail through faster, um, but they are, I mean, because they are such massive construction projects, yeah, they're, they're pretty intensive. So uh, like I say, this, this Swan Lake license, you know, they're, three years into their license and not even a shovel of dirt. It's like, so when are you gonna do this? Uh, batteries on the other hand, um, it was just like a four month time between ordering your Tesla mega packs and having them show up on a truck. Um, they're in such high demand now that now it's a, it's a year out, but still, you know, first quarter, you know, a year from now, you could theoretically throw up, you know, 500 megawatts, a thousand megawatts of batteries and be in the energy storage business. Um, that's a much quicker response time. Um, obviously there's regulatory issues. I mean, there's state permitting issues. I'm sure there's federal issues. Uh, you interconnect with transmission lines. Um, you know, uh, there's a project in the Columbia Gorge proposed project, Goldendale, which, you know, there's plans on tying into the grid at John Day Dam. Well, that's a, was it 1200 megawatt project or? something like this, well over a thousand megawatt project. And I'm sure there are questions to be answered about what would be the impacts of a thousand megawatts going online and offline in pretty short order um, into the grid. So that stuff all has to be sorted out. Um, I, I actually, and not to be, make too long of an answer, you know, my vision, like my vision in Boise, Idaho here is that you know, every house, every south facing roof in, in this town has a, a, a row of solar panels on it. And every so often through the neighborhoods, there's a mega pack sitting there behind the fence. And you actually operate, this is more of a micro grid where people's houses are generating solar when they're at work during the day, um, excess power is going into that, into that mega pack. And then when they come home at night, turn the lights on and and do dinner and everything else, that mega pack is discharging. You actually have an interactive grid that's more, more of a micro grid, more, more of a neighborhood type, type of a thing instead of these big massive, you know, statewide or multi-statewide giant power grids. Uh, these things are so, you know, you can locate them anywhere, mo mostly anywhere you can, you can locate them. And so why not spread it out and, and, uh, and make it more, make it more of a, of a local thing. So that's kind of my, my vision for, for the future in Boise here. Yeah, the figuring out transmission systems and interconnected grids is obviously a big part of this conversation and, and not the topic of our, of our conversation today, but. Um, That's way beyond my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> figuring out the grids is another thing. Um, Nick, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you, Colleen. Um, hey, Kevin. Uh, hey, Nick. Nick Nelson with Idaho River United. Um, Kevin, I'm curious to get your take, and I don't know how much, how far you've delved into this, but the uh, molten salt energy storage um, coupled with, say, Terra Power's nuclear plant that they're building, um, or they're taking over from the Naughton plant in Southwest Wyoming. Do you see that as a viable thing and something that'll be replicated across the West and perhaps the U.S.? I, I think I think I think thermal storage like molten salt or or just large mass. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I always thought about building a in my backyard just a almost like a pool, fill it full of a big river rock, circulate water through it, and then heat it with a with a, a solar panel then have a hot water system. I, I think thermal storage is, is probably very viable. Um, I'm not, I don't think about, about connecting to a nuke plant. Uh, I'm not exactly uh, a flag waver for nukes. My, you know, our, our Congressman um, is a great fan of nukes since he's from Eastern Idaho and that's where the Idaho National Lab is. And 
in conversations with with him over the years, he always goes back to, well, we just need to build some these small modular reactors. And, and my response is, fine, go ahead. I mean, in my opinion, they're not going to work. I mean, the most expensive power we have out there right now is coming from nukes. Uh, why would we be paying over, you know, over a hundred dollars a megawatt hour for nuclear power when you can pay twenty to thirty dollars an hour for renewable power? Doesn't make sense. So, uh, I, I just don't see nukes as being a long-term solution. But who knows? But I think I think. Thermal storage like molten salts, I, I think that certainly is, is a technology that's, that is probably going to get, gain some legs. Thanks, Kevin. So, Kevin, I'll ask, and well, I'll let Andrew go, but I also, again, invite people to turn their cameras on during the discussion if you're comfortable doing so. Uh, Andrea, over to you. Yeah, um, I was wondering if you had done any analysis or given any thought to sort of like total environmental impact of these various technologies because you know even though I'm pretty familiar with pump storage and the impact they have on rivers in my watershed um, which is the Connecticut River watershed in the eastern part of the U.S. Um, you know some of the uh, other kinds of batteries involve mining you know in different parts of the world that have their own set of impacts so i was just wondering if if um any of the other technologies would have theoretically have a lower sort of lower total impact and then what's the design life of of these various technologies Sure, I'll see if I can remember all the parts of your question. <laughs> you know, batteries, uh, batteries definitely. I mean, you, you, it's kind of in the news about lithium. I mean, exploiting third world countries for their resources to make our lives better is not necessarily a good way to go through life. Um, and so there are certainly issues with, with, uh, with extraction to build batteries. Um, I think the flip side is they are, the industry is, is looking at more and more different materials for batteries, more and more different designs of batteries uh, with a goal of being easily recyclable and not exploiting third world countries. So uh, that, that work is going on. Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, a project like that hydro store that I showed you that compressed air project, to me, a project like that is, is likely relatively benign. Uh, one of their big things is, is, is using as many off the shelf parts as they can. So they're not building specialized turbines or whatever else. It's basically stuff you just order that's already in production. Um, you tunnel straight down below your property and, and build your caverns. Uh, so your footprint is, is, is fairly small. Uh, I, I, I suspect that technology is, 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 is probably gonna shine. Um, one technology I didn't talk about, or two technologies I didn't talk about, one of them is called gravity. And, and they, they actually built a test project where they had this big giant crane with multiple heads on it. And when there was surplus power, this crane would go down and attach these big giant concrete blocks and lift them up and then stack them at a higher elevation and just keep stacking these concrete blocks till they had the whole pile of concrete blocks. And we're talking blocks that weighed, you know, 20 tons a piece or something really heavy. And then when you needed power, you reached back up and you picked up a block and you used the weight of that block going back down on this cable to spin your turbine to generate electricity. So you're basically picking up heavy objects and moving them from here to here and back again. Once again, pretty benign. And I kind of went down this rabbit hole last night on the web with gravity. And, and I saw this, this con conceptual idea where they went into the ground and basically carved this big giant cylinder of, of bedrock, you know, so maybe a hundred feet deep and across the bottom, then use hydraulic, uh, hydraulic power that when they had surplus power, they would slowly start to raise this giant mass of bedrock that probably weighed you know, a million tons or something like that. And 
when they needed to generate power, the same thing. They would just reverse the flow of the hydraulics and spin turbines with it as, as this thing settled back down. And I mean, it would be it would move very incrementally because it was so huge and massive. So, you know, the reality is that the sky is kind of the limit on, on technologies and designs and applications. And at the end of the day, it just, you know, it, it, it basically has to be efficient and, and return the investment for the people who pay for it. Which, you know, I'm the last guy to figure out what, who's going to win or lose in that. But uh, I, I think, you know, for us, for me, you know, for, from the, the kind of work that I've always done, you know, I'm, I'm a river advocate. I have been and I will be until I die. And, um, you know, pump storage projects have the potential to affect my interests. And they have the potential to affect interests of, of, of uh, you know, people I support, Native American tribes that uh, are, are, are uh, you know, disaffected by the, by the, by the project. So, uh, you know, they have to be, you know, they, 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 ha they have to, they have to be able, they have to be scrutinized and, and survive that scrutiny. And, uh, I think that's a, that's a healthy conversation for everybody to have. I do want to add on though quickly to, to that. I mean, Andrea, I think the question you raise about environmental and social impacts outside of the US is super important and something that we can't lose sight of. Um, so, you know, supply chains and fair trade and, you know, that gets into lots of different other themes that I think, you know, there are different ways to try to address some of those in terms of, you know, policies that are made um, at the federal level. But um, but I think that's really important to keep in our minds as we have this conversation too. Colleen, just just for just for a, a real quick brief. Uh, so you know Tesla, uh, their battery design, uh, you know they have a certain battery design, but just recently they've actually on some of their cars they've moved to a different type battery, which is lithium iron instead of lithium ion. So you're you're not dealing with um, a lot of the a lot of the problems, and it, plus it's a like a hundred percent recyclable battery, and so um, they're moving some of their vehicles, the shorter range vehicles, um, uh, to this kind of a battery. So I, I, th I think the industry is um, is aware of this. I mean, how how responsive they are, responsible they are, I can't say, but. Uh, I think it's it's our job, our, our collective job to, you know, keep them accountable. No. Great. Kate, you've got your hand raised. Oh, Kate, you're on mute. Thanks, and thanks, Kevin, for all this information. Um, just sort of pursuing the question of um, impacts uh, and and Actually, I don't know the answer to this question. There are uh, obviously climate change driving effects associated with hydropower dams and reservoirs. Um, are there those effects associated with pump storage? And I assume at least if you're creating some kind of a, um, a reservoir up high to hold your water, it would have some of the methane producing uh, effects at as a, another type of reservoir would? I'm not sure. Uh, I think the potential is there. Uh, certainly the potential is there. Uh, you know, the, the, the things it takes to trigger methane production in storage reservoirs, you know, may or may not apply to these same kind of reservoirs. I'm, I'm just not sure. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because obviously that's an additional concern if we're trying to, uh, you know, ramp down on the forms of energy that are going to push climate change. Um, well, I, I, I agree, and, and I, would, I would go a little bit further. I, I, I think that when you look at the construction of these projects, a lot of times there's a huge carbon uh, input into the system by building these projects. When you're, you know, blasting and grading and tunneling and pouring massive amounts of concrete, you know, that has a carbon footprint. 
And, and so that needs to be considered in the mix as well. So I think there are projects that would, that would be lower carbon than other projects. Absolutely. And given the, as you said, the footprint, and I assume the amount of time and money involved in building these, I mean, we're supposed to be, uh, you know, we have 10 to 15 years to turn all of this around from a climate perspective. Why would we want to encourage the construction of a massive, I mean, potentially large construction project that would then need to last, hang around for a while to make it even worthwhile for the, the person promoting it? Yeah. Those are good points, Kate. <clears throat> All right, I'll ask one more question and then if no one else has any others, then, oh, okay. Um, well, so Andrea, let me ask this one first and then, and then back to you. Um, so Kevin, we hear a lot from uh, industry, what a big percentage of energy storage, pump storage, hydro makes up. I think they normally quote it to be around 97% of energy storage in the country currently is pump storage. I think that number is probably dropping quickly. I wonder if you have a sense of how that uh, balance is shifting. Uh, excuse my cynical nature, <laughs> but I, I have a bit of heartburn with that number, with that percentage. Um, and, and I think that that's uh, what they might be doing uh, to, let's say, put a thumb on the scale is I suspect that they are adding to the actual pump storage capacity, large reservoirs like Grand Coulee uh, into, the, into that mix. And, and well, I, I probably shouldn't use Grand Coulee because Grand Coulee actually has pump storage attached to it. But let's say Shasta Dam in California, you know, it's a, it's a 4.3 million acre, acre foot storage reservoir. Uh, there's a lot of potential there, but it's not pump storage. Uh, so I'm just not sure of the number they're using, of that percentage they're using. I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I buy it. And even if I did buy it, I would say that number is, is decreasing by the day. Because battery projects are coming online left and right, and like I said, pump storage is not. Um, they're talking about it, um, and and even deeper than that, when I look at, I mean, I mean, everybody's going to tout their technology as being the greatest thing since sliced bread. I understand that, but when when I I was looking at a a certain website last night on a proposed pump storage project, and and. What they were saying was just not exactly true. I mean, uh, they talk about pump storage being the only form of long-term energy storage. And that's true. I mean, if you have a, a, a thousand megawatt pump storage project and you've got so many acre feet of water up, up at the top ready for you to generate with, if you generate a thousand megawatts, that water is gonna be exhausted in eight hours, 10 hours, something like that. Uh, you're out of water. You've got to start pumping at that point. So they're kind of inferring that pump storage is good for days and days and days of generation, which it would be if you generated 10 megawatts at a time. You could generate for a number of days. But at the same time, does that help the situation you're in? If you're only generating 10 megawatts, you're not really a big player in the game anymore because your project's really made to generate a thousand megawatts. So it, it's kind of, a, it's kind of a, a bit of a game with the numbers uh, when, you, when you look at these, these projects um, and you have to really sit down with a calculator and do a little bit of math and, and you realize that uh, what they're inferring may not exactly be true. So, um, yeah. All right, Andrea, our last question. Um, yeah, I thought I heard you say that uh, you know of a couple pump storage or several pump storage facilities that are mothballed. Are these existing facilities that ran for a while and then stopped operating? I'd like yes, to there, there's a pretty large pump storage project that's part of the Oroville Dam complex in California. And they had a fire 
a number of years ago uh, imparted their system either in a raceway or in the powerhouse area or whatever it was, that project's never gone back online again. I mean, they just don't talk about it. It's like it doesn't exist and it does exist. Um, I think there's a project in the Northeast that's also mothballed, the, the project that used to actually pump store and operate. So, you know, there's, I don't know, there's, there's, there's gotta be a reason why, I mean, if, it, if it was such a great thing, it'd all be running full time. It'd all be operating, right? I mean, what's what's the use of having a project that cost, you know? Well, I, I guess I guess the flip side is is some of these projects. I mean, um, Orville was built a number of years ago. Helms Creek in the Central Sierra was built by PG&E back in the '70s or '80s, I think. Um, you know, and and it's it's. You know, it kind of depends on the economics, but it to me it just doesn't make much sense to have a project that's not operating if, in fact, it's economical. I mean, that's that's why coal plants and nuke plants are shutting down is they can't compete in the market anymore. And something's telling me that pump storage projects are probably going to have a tough time competing in the market, especially against batteries and wind. Great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today for our brown bag. And a huge thank you to Kevin for this presentation and for all of your time. We do have a couple of other uh, brown bags coming up, uh, one next month and one the following month. So I will send that information out to you with a recording of this presentation um, just as soon as I can figure out how to compress the file enough to get it up on the website. <laughs> so uh, stay tuned for that. And um, I will let you go a couple minutes before the hour, but really appreciate everyone taking the time to be with us. Yeah, same here. Thanks everybody, really appreciate it. Thanks Kevin, thanks Colleen. Thank you.